Tasto verde. Hi everyone, uh, good morning and thank you for being here um, in this beautiful Venetian morning, yeah, wonderful light. This is one of the really interesting rooms in this building. This is the main building, Cafoscari, and as you can see around you, you know, it's an intervention on a medieval building by a famous architect called Carlos Scarpa, and, uh, you know, there's a all the layers of you know, 20th century and 21st century Italy sort of coming together. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. I'm Francesca Tarocco, and I'm the director of NICHE, the new Institute Center for Environmental Humanities here at Cafosca University of Venice. And I'm delighted today to be together with our, um, the, the, the PI of one of our research clusters, Enric Bow, who is a food a studies person and a literature person, and with Fuchsia Dunlop, a very uh, good friend since many years and a wonderful food writer. So today we're going to have a conversation around matters of food and food writing and eating and all the delightful things around that. Um, Unfortunately, a few of our colleagues are not well today, so uh, the programs will be distributed in a minute, but before that, uh, I'll give the floor to Enric for a brief introduction to today's proceedings. Okay, thank, well, thank you very much, uh, Francesca, and welcome to everybody, and it's great to have you all here, and it's a beautiful occasion some kind of cloudy day, but it's going to get better, if not colder. Uh, and I just wanted to, well, as it, it is mandatory in, the, in all conferences, I, I want to thank, first of all, Nish and her director, uh, Francesca Tarocco, who has been very supportive of the initiative that we've had with Santiago Larcon and myself, and also the, the well, the the university, particularly the department, uh, my department of uh, Studi Linguistici e Culturali Comparati, uh, the Institute Ramon Llull in Barcelona, and also the Instituto, Instituto Cervantes in Milan. And uh, I, I just wanted to, well, I'm not going to do a presentation about, uh, as you may uh, understand from the, or gather from the program, this is a dual approach to uh, material eco-criticism, from the perspective of the blue humanities or the or food studies. Uh, as you know, well, uh, there are some, some interesting issues, about, uh, uh, information about blue humanities, no? They say, for example, David Helber says that more is known about the dark side of the moon than is known about the depths of the oceans, no? Or another interesting information is that Rachel Carson, the founder of our, uh, studies, uh, she didn't know how to swim, so maybe that's why <laughs> she was so good at <laughs> talking, writing about oceans, etc. And this, this is going to be one, some, some of, the, some of the, the interventions of the papers deal with uh, blue humanities, others with general uh, issues, and the, the, the other, more or less the other half, deal with uh, food, uh, food studies. No? Uh, as we know, is, this is a, a new field that has been developing or has been growing in the last uh, few years uh, dramatically. And I would like to remind something that one of the, uh, that, uh, what's his name, yeah, uh, Warren Bel Belasco wrote in his uh, very well-known book, Food, the Key Concepts. Uh, he, was, uh, he, he, he was discussing the, the culinary triangle, no? responsibility, identity, and convenience. And also, he talk, speaking about, and we, we may develop this a little bit further with uh, Fuxia Dunlop, uh, talking about the westernized food system, he, uh, <laughs> he got a typology of the eight Fs. None is what you may think. Family, fast, fried, filling, fresh, fantasy, Fordism, and franchising, <laughs> which is a whole landscape, or foodscape, I should say, of uh, the Western world. In any case, uh, it's, uh, the, 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 our gathering deals, is going to be dealing with those, these two issues, blue humanities, not only oceans, but also rivers, uh, uh, food studies, 
And we will get started right away with uh, our conversation with uh, Fuxia Don Donlop. Uh, one, uh, there's a, a, uh, we are going to have the programs in a minute because we've had, because of COVID, we've had some, there's a delay, but we have the programs in a minute, but many of you have already seen it. But there's a, a little change in the program because one of the participants, weather uh, related issues, who's come, flying from California, uh, had his plane delayed, so he's, gonna, he's arriving today. He was supposed to speaking the second one in this morning. So we, we are going to switch, switch with, uh, very kindly she agreed to, with Shasha Gora. So it's the only, so far it's the only change in the program, but <laughs> we'll remind you of this. So instead of, at, uh, if you have the, oh, I'll, I'll remind it, but at, uh, uh, at 12, 12, 15, instead of Ignacio Lopez Calvo from California, it's going to be Shasha Gora, okay? So, Oh. Yes, of course. Thank you. Yes, so we, st we, we thought um, that it would be an interesting thing to do uh, for a conference of this kind to, to try and actually involve people who are writing about food uh, in a very scholarly manner, but still for a for an audience, for a public audience, and I think I think Fuchsia is an excellent example of this particular uh, mode of writing. So, uh, and we can hear from her how she does it. Uh, so, Fuchsia Dunlop is an award-winning writer, uh, author of seven books, uh, of which this is the last one we're going to discuss today, Invitation to the Bank, to a Banquet, the History of Chinese Food. And she's been doing this for, I think, the best part of 30 years mm -hmm. or so. Uh, she started very young, of course, very, very young. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and uh, uh, um, yeah, educated in Oxford and Cambridge. Uh, Fuchsia also attended a uh, you know, a proper Chinese culinary uh, 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 school. So she's actually trained as a chef, as well as a brilliant ethnographer. So I really want to start from that. If you can tell us a little bit, Fuchsia, you know, when did your engagement with China started? Why Chinese food? And how do you go about researching and, and collecting recipes and doing your great ethnographic work that you do? So I, I always wanted to be a chef when I was a very small child. I remember telling a teacher when I was 11, that's what I wanted to do when I grew up. Um, and so I was cooking quite seriously through my teens, but um, I grew up in Oxford. All my friends were going to university, so I sort of did that automatically, went to, went to Cambridge and did a degree in English literature. Um, but I was always most interested in food. And um, China happened by accident. So after graduating, I had an editorial job where I was sub-editing lots of material about the Asia-Pacific region. And I just got mildly interested in China. In 1992, I went backpacking there and something just attracted me. Um, so I came back to London and started learning Mandarin in evening classes once a week, a snail's pace. Um, and then finally, in 1994, I got a British Council scholarship to go and study in China. And I came up with lots of very convincing academic reasons why I had to choose Chengdu, the capital of Sichuan province. But one of the main reasons for me was that I knew it was a center of Chinese gastronomy. And I visited the previous year and just had an amazing food experience. And I thought it would be a great place to live and also off the beaten track. I didn't want to go with all the other foreigners to Beijing and Shanghai. I wanted to be really immersed in China. Um, and as you might guess, as soon as I got to Chengdu, I got pretty quickly distracted from my official studies. <laughs> and um, I, I, I started really um, concentrating on the language and, of course, Chinese as a very sophisticated cuisine, there's a whole vocabulary of food and cooking methods and ingredients that you don't learn in school anyway. And I started um, trying to translate menus and then um, persuading local restaurants to let me study in their kitchens. Um, and then I heard about this famous culinary institute and a German friend and I went to visit and they agreed to give us some private classes. Um, so that was really the beginning and then after I'd finished at the university I was, um, I went to greet my teachers and they said we have this professional chef's foundation course just starting, why don't you join in? 
and I immediately said yes. And so I was actually the first foreign student they'd had, and I was in a class of 50 young Sichuanese men and two women, um, full-time learning the craft of Sichuan cooking and, and many of the classic dishes. And um, it was um, a fantastic um, initiation, not just into Sichuanese cooking, but into Chinese cooking in general. So there was the craft of knife work, the art of cutting, which has been so fundamental to Chinese cooking for about 2,000 years, um, and concepts about handling of ingredients, cooking methods. And that was really the beginning. So that was in 1995. And ever since then, I have been um, researching and exploring Chinese food. And um, when I go to China, people often, you know, Chinese people who I meet for the first time, they say, why have you come to China? And I say, I've come here to eat. <laughs> and they think I'm joking, but I'm not really joking because I have really, um, I've really tried to understand at a practical and sensory level about Chinese food. Like I am very, I have a big library of books and I read obviously and I'm interested in the history and the culture but I'm also interested in it as a sensory experience um, and as, you know, the art of cooking. Um, interestingly, in China, um, there's historically been a, a big divide between the sort of literary types who wrote about food. Um, so most of the historic Chinese cookbooks were written by gentlemen of letters, one or two women, who collected recipes, but on the whole, they didn't really cook. They had, you know, Yuan Mei, the 18th century, um, the, the mo best known food writer, he had private chefs cooking for him. Um, so there's been a big divide between the literary types um, and the, um, the actual chefs, many of whom were not literate, a sort of oral tradition, a practical tradition. And that still um, <coughs> endures today, really. So I know a huge number of food writers in China and many chefs. Um, a few in the, like my position overlapping, but not that many. And actually, when I've done sort of book talks in China um, in recent years, one of the questions that I often get asked is um, by young Chinese people is whether my parents were devastated <laughs> when, after having sent me to Cambridge, I went to cooking school. <laughs> it's like, I don't see it as a divide. So anyway, so, and in terms of my research, so, I mean, originally, I just went to the cooking school because I loved cooking. It wasn't really a career move. I was interested in China, but it's taken me into a greater appreciation of all kinds of facets of Chinese culture and civilization, um, you know, art, literature, architect, it's, it's all related. Absolutely. Fisher, may I ask sorry, you yeah. to read, so that you get a sense of where we are. Uh, this is the beginning of a chapter in Fuchsia's book. If you can read for us, there's also a little bit of Venice in it. Huh? No, it's Okay. So, yeah. Can you hear me? It's working. Um, Salmazo funciona. How much do you want me to read? Maybe just the first paragraph. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, just to say that this book is constructed around a sort of menu of dishes not really meant to be served together, but each chapter is the name of a dish which I felt would say something quite profound about Chinese culinary culture and tradition. So this one is called Song Sao Yu Geng, the, harm, um, the harmonious Geng, Mrs. Song's fish stew. Um, Mrs. Song's fish Geng or chowder is a speciality of the southeastern Chinese city of Hangzhou. Inhale the steam that drifts up from the bowl, and you'll find your senses beguiled by a gentle savouriness laced with a refreshing spritz of vinegar. The soup, neither solid nor completely liquid, is a swirling kaleidoscope of colour like Venetian glass made edible, the flow of the ingredients held motionless by the starch that thickens the broth. The palette of colours is balanced, Morsels of white fish, golden wisps of egg yolk, slivers of dark mushroom and ivory bamboo shoot, a few shreds of pink ham and green spring onion to fit finish. The soup is made from a dozen different ingredients, but none clamors for individual attention. Together they blend harmoniously. <laughs> 
So, I mean, you get the sense of, uh, you know, Fuchsia's attempt to really translate that culinary experience into writing, which is also a remarkable feat. Yes. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Francesca. I, I think that, uh, yeah, in this uh, paragraph, short paragraph she, uh, Fuchsia read to us, you can detect one uh, characteristic of her, of her books, I would say, is that uh, they are all constructed as some sort of, as they call it now, foudoir from memoir, food, war, no? so memory of food. <laughs> and it, it, it's full of uh, experiences, little anecdotes, so it's, uh, it's very entertaining and very, it's a nice way of getting into the, it's also very technical, so it's not only uh, remembrance of things eaten. <laughs> but uh, I wanted to ask you uh, about divides, maybe, uh, to start with. Uh, one, one of them would be, uh, in uh, this uh, 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 sentence you use uh, quite frequently, uh, which is especially uh, older generations, especially <laughs> younger generations, and uh, I would I would like uh, to ask you how is the the, the in a way the Westernization is there a big change uh, taking place in uh, Chinese food uh, because of either globalization or the contact much more open with the West or how is the situation according to... Yeah, to well, I mean, so anyone who's been in China over the last sort of 20 or 30 years has known that the, the difference in everything is almost inexpressibly huge. Um, and with food, um, yes, there's a dramatic difference from... I mean, when I was there in the 1990s, um, there were no supermarkets. There wasn't really takeout in the way that we knew it, know it today. Um, most of the adult generation were very proficient cooks, men as well as women, um, and they could not only cook, but they could make pickles, they could cure meats in winter, they were, they had, were really highly skilled. Um, and, um, and, and also people didn't have a lot of money, so they had to be more creative, and you, there were no shortcuts. <laughs> um, I would describe, I mean, what has happened, I, I don't think I would describe it really as westernization, in the sense that um, certainly China has gone through a period um, of openness to the outside world and new ingredients, but I think one of the points I tried to make in the book is that Chinese food itself is the product of many you know, centuries or millennia of, of cultural exchanges. There have been periods in the past, notably you know, the Han Dynasty 2,000 years ago, when a whole lot of techniques and ingredients came in. So, um, but I think what's changed, many of the same pressures that we have in other countries, which is the growth of fast food, um, the decline of artisanal food and cooking skills, um, they're really exacerbated in China by certain things like the evacuation of the countryside to the cities. So in the city, in, in villages, you often have elderly people and tiny children, and everyone of working age has left, and this is, uh, is a break in tradition. Um, I went to Sichuan um, for the Chinese New Year a few years ago, really hope, I had this dream in my mind of the old granny making the lovely traditional dishes, and it was too late. You know, I had done that in other parts of China 20, 30 years ago, but this case, the family I was staying with, um, the elderly parents were very, very old and frail. All the sons had left to the city and they were just kind of going camping, you know, um, and the children couldn't cook. And the other thing in China is that um, with the single child policy and extreme academic pressure, um, that children, I think, strangely for a country that is so infatuated with eating and food and the whole culture of food, people don't really respect cooking either as a profession or as an activity. And so I, have, I know all these adults who are brilliant cooks and their children and grandchildren, they're forced to study all the time, they have to get into the good schools, they're not learning to cook. And um, so now, I mean, the very funny that um, it just quite a lot of times this has happened, but in London, my neighbor is a Hong Kong Chinese woman who came as a student, and I was stunned to find out that she was learning to cook from my cookbooks. And I asked her, like, why? <laughs> you grew up in Hong Kong. Why are you learning to cook? And she said, well, you know, my parents didn't take me 
teach me to cook. And I ring up my mother and I say, how do you do this? And my mother is so vague. She says, just add a little of this and a little of that. Quanto basta, right? <laughs> and then, yeah, anyway, so there is this break in tradition and um, added to which environmental problems yeah. and, um, you know, Rapid Since you mentioned the environment, uh, we often have this conversation around, you know, the relationship between uh, 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 the environmental crisis and uh, and food um, and eating practices. Why do you think it's important that we know more about Chinese food? I mean, does does Chinese food matter in a sense? I mean, of course, considering you know China's population and and shift towards meat eating or a lot more meat eating in recent in recent decades as, as China grew as China's population grew richer and richer but this is not really what Chinese food practices used to look like yeah well I think I was just looking at the word entanglements on your and, and I feel that um, sort of perceptions of Chinese food have always been very entangled with broader prejudice against Chinese culture and misunderstandings about Chinese food. And there are quite a number of these that I address in the book. Um, but in particular, um, I think um, there's a sort of stereotype, I don't know about in Italy, but certainly in America and even in Britain, that Chinese food is unhealthy. People are associating it with um, takeout fried food. Um, and also, um, I think there's a real double standard when talking about environmental issues in Chinese food. So we hear a lot about shark's fin and um, the, the trade in trafficked illegal ingredients in China, which is undoubtedly a problem, and shark's fin is a very unsustainable food. Um, and certainly, I think it's important that we address these issues, but I think it's often done in a very one-sided way. Um, the Chinese, for example, attract much more opprobrium for eating um, shark's fin than English chefs do for cooking in eel, which is now critically endangered, and so on. Um, and I think that um, there's a, the, there tends to be a sort of slightly macabre focus on this very elite minority activity. You know, these ingredients are hugely expensive and um, out of reach or even inclination of most Chinese people. Um, and I think it obscures a broader picture. Again, also, you know, we hear a lot about the Chinese eating more meat and the pressure on the environment. Again, it's completely true. From a Chinese point of view, I think people would see that they're just catching up with the decadence of the you know, Americans. <laughs> and, um, you know, they're still, it, it, this, they have a long way to go before they're as greedy and extravagant as Americans and, and Europeans, really. Um, but I think that it obscures um, a, a civilization in which, um, firstly, health was absolutely fundamental, and chi Chinese food has been understood as medicine since really the beginnings of written civilization. Um, there's also an idea about balance and harmony, which was sort of mentioned in this. Um, and there's a phrase that people often say, tian, um, tian yi, uh, sort of harmony of people and nature. Um, so there are sort of ideas about um, which you might use a modern term of sustainability and harmony with the seasons and nature that are rooted in Chinese food. And also the traditional Chinese diet um, is particularly, I mean, it could be a model for more sustainable eating. Um, so the traditional Chinese diet is, is very much about vegetables and grain foods with meat used as a kind of flavor principle, except at festivals. So at Chinese New Year, you would gorge on pork from the pig that you'd fattened up. But otherwise, you would be eating um, a lot of vegetables um, with meat used, you know, um, a steak that would feed one American a piece of meat like that in Chinese uh, sort of terms is, is typically cut into small pieces and cooked with a load of vegetables and eaten with other vegetables and rice. Um, so in that sense, it's a real model. Um, also, the Chinese have for thousands of years, at least 2,000 years, been fermenting soybeans. That's something Europeans never did. We didn't even have soy until, I think, the 18th century, and we never fermented. We fermented lots of other things, but not beans. Um, fermenting soy c creates these incredibly delicious umami flavors um, and gives a richness to vegetarian ingredients. 
Um, as does, I mean, something you do in Italy too, but using small amounts of cured pork, like guanciale, or in China, or la ro, xiang chan, you know, to, to give flavor to vegetables. Um, so as a culinary system, it offers real possibilities. But I think more than that, and here's another um, Western stereotype, which is the Chinese eat everything, okay? <laughs> Um, and this has been um, always interpreted incredibly negatively. You know, the Chinese were poor and desperate and they would eat any old rubbish. And this is so misleading because, sure, a Chinese farmer will eat every bit of the pig, but, you know, at the imperial dinner table, you would have deer tendons, um, you know, duck, goose, feet. These things are, are eaten for pleasure, not for, <laughs> for desperation. <laughs> and. Um, and I think in, in Chinese food, the, firstly, I mean, this is another, there's a whole chapter about this, the appreciation of texture mm. opens a door to a whole, a, a whole realm of gastronomy, which is largely neglected in the West. And once you appreciate texture, you can appreciate a much wider range of ingredients. So slithery things, slimy things, grisly things. These are ugly words in English, right? But in China, <laughs> these textures are really appreciated. Um, and I think that I prefer and combined to... combined with other things. Combined with other things, yeah. And I think that um, in Chinese food, there's another chapter which is about um, xiazi yopi. It's an absolutely delicious Cantonese dish made with the pith of the pomelo, that giant mm. citrus fruit. Yeah. Now, the pith is just like colorless, cottony, a little bit bitter. Everyone else would throw it in the bin. Cantonese chefs have an ingenious way of soaking it, rinsing it, getting rid of any bitterness, and then cooking it in this opulent stock made with chicken and pork and toasted fish. And anyway, it, it, this is one of my favorite Cantonese dishes. And I find that this, um, you know, the Chinese have always loved eating exotic and thrilling and unusual things, dishes that surprise you. You know, like the avant-garde chefs of the West, something that looks like something else, you know, something that, that plays with the mind. Um, they have also appreciated textures, um, and um, they ha also have a very, very thoughtful and complex system of cooking with many different cooking methods and concepts. And I think all this comes together to mean that you, from a Chinese point of view, you can take something like jellyfish, you know, jellyfish, which is, it doesn't have much going for it from a Western point of view. It's colorless and tasteless. It's just nothing. It's like the first time I had it, I thought it was like eating rubber bands, <laughs> you know? But actually, from a Chinese point of view, you, you can think analytically, well, what does it have going for it? Well, it has this rather lovely, slippery, crisp texture, a combination of textures, very appreciated in China. So then, well, what do I do? Well, then... I, I purify its flavor so it doesn't have any you know, little legacy of fishiness, so I've just got pure texture. Then I add in some flavor, maybe some lovely mature vinegar, maybe some garlic, some sesame oil, um, and then I add in some color which it lacks, maybe some shredded cucumber, and suddenly you have something that is a very lovely dish. And just at a time when Western chefs are now trying to think of ways of making plant foods appetizing, you know, to, so that we don't need as much meat, thinking of ways of eating insects. It's like when a Western chef like René Rezepi of Noma cooks reindeer penises or some extraordinary ingredient, everyone goes, oh, he's a creative genius. But Chinese chefs have been doing this forever and they're not, you know, I think it's just, there's so much inspiration in a way that is both about pleasure but also has ideas that are relative I mean, that are relevant to the debate about sustainability. Yeah, absolutely. That's a very good point. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe uh, something, so, something I, I, I really enjoyed uh, in your books is that uh, you, of course, you describe food or food experiences, but also you pay attention to uh, what's around the growing food. Or, and for example, something that I didn't know about is the why there are no cows <laughs> in, in China. <laughs> You don't see, I mean, they are sacred a few miles away, you know, in, in India, but then all of a sudden, not a single cow. And I think what you, if you could develop a little bit uh, for the audience, the important, importance of uh, soybean, and then the impact also in the diet, of course, but also the, the landscape, no? which is, I think it's yeah. extremely interesting, that yeah. uh, issue. So the soybean was, was probably domesticated in China about 3,000 years ago. And as I mentioned, they've been fermenting the soybean for 
more than 2,000 years. Mm -hmm. Tofu seems to have come later. There's a lot of controversy about exactly when it was, um, was sort of developed, but um, it, there's a very interesting possibility that tofu is connected with the cheese-making habits of the nomads on the um, fringes of China. I, when I went, I went to a place in Yunnan where they make che goat's cheese, and learnt how to make it, and it was absolutely striking how the process was almost nice. identical to tofu. So the Chinese may have learnt. Or, anyway, it's a very interesting question. There's but, a distinct um, possibility that, that tofu is not Chinese, actually, or Japanese. Oh right, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, the, pro the, the process. Um, they already had mills for milling wheat. So you know, once you mill soybeans that are wet, you get something milky. And anyway, it, this is a whole other question. Um, but so tofu has been very much established for. I don't know, about a thousand years, something like that, a bit more than a thousand years. Um, so this choice, the interesting thing about um, soya is that it offers much of the same nutrition as dairy foods, um, but in a much more sustainable way because you're not um, giving all the grain to the cows to then turn into milk. You're using the grain to make the milk directly, cutting out the, the sort of middleman. Um, and um, yeah, so I mean, it's a very interesting question. Dairy foods have been part of the Chinese tradition, but a minor part, and they have never been, and, and not. And while the Chinese have been fantastically creative with just about every ingredient, other ingredient, they have not really explored the possibilities of dairy. It's a very interesting question why, but the role of the soybean undoubtedly must be very important in this because this ingenuity that you find in other aspects has been applied to soya and creating many different Absolutely. forms of, of tofu, fresh fermented pressed, you know, all this kind of thing. And um, yes, so as you, as you said, I mean, this had huge implications for the Chinese diet, and that's another reason why the Chinese traditional diet could be a model of inspiration for sort of um, reducing the role of meat and animal, you know, dairy. And particularly beef, I mean, think. I think, uh, I think Enric was uh, hinting at that, right? Why, why very little beef consumption? That also has to do with taboos, with religious taboos, particularly with Buddhism. Uh -huh. uh, so, so, so the way in which Buddhism uh, uh, approaches the whole business of eating is A, to pretty much enforce a vegetarian diet on at least uh, uh, the clerical elites and on a religious ritual and liturgical basis uh, on the, the laity as well. And then it also targets certain animals as being part of this entanglement between humans and non-humans, and one of these animals is the cow. Mm -hmm. so, so buffaloes and cows really have not been and still today, I think, okay, now there is a switch to, to, to well, the American mm. diet to a certain extent, both in China and in Japan. But until the mid 19th, until the mid 20th century, you know, people were very, you know, still quite reluctant to eat beef. And as you were saying, you know, as you mentioned, uh, as I mentioned this a bit in the book, that also um, people don't. So people kept animals in, on a very small scale. Yeah. So they would keep pigs, which could hoover up all the waste from the farm and the kitchen and then produce wonderful meat. Um, and they kept chickens and they did keep some sheep and made, but, but cows and water buffaloes were, were used for labor in the field and you don't see folks. So yeah, the whole Chinese landscape, um, it was very striking for a European that you yeah. do not see pasture lands. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, at most you might see a little flock of tiny goats on a hilly mm -hmm. bit of land, but you only see big flocks on, you know, the fringes, the sort of, um, you know, Tibet, um, the Mongolian grasslands, these areas which were historically, you know, other ethnic groups. I mean, they were not Han Chinese. And um, so, yes, it's a hot, the landscape and the foodscape has been very yeah. much influenced by this historic and it's a, choice to... It's super problematic. As you say, in fact, yeah. it is a waterscape, really, more, more than a landscape, right? Uh, particularly in southern China. Yeah. I don't know if you want to say something about the wateriness of food and the landscape or the waterscape of southern China, which is... Uh, yeah, so um, southern China, particularly the Jiangnan region about, around sort of Shanghai, which is where a lot of the early Chinese food writing came from, um, that um, it's known as Yumi Zhixiang, land of fish and rice, both produced in water. Um, and um, it's, um, 
What, what's really interesting is that in this region there are, you know, there were canal cities like Venice, places like Suzhou and Shaoxing, you can still see vestiges of that, um, but lakes and marshes, this very watery landscape, and of course also the eastern coast. And um, the diet of this region is incredibly rich in water produce. So a city like Hangzhou, even from the description of Marco Polo, people were eating this astonishing array of both sea fish and inland fish. Um, so you get a huge range of seafood, particularly in Ningbo near Shanghai, um, um, fish and crustaceans and so on. And then a huge number of freshwater, um, there's a word in Chinese which is, well, haixian means seafood. There's another word, hexian, like river delicacies, which covers the, the freshwater equivalent for seafood. And it is a very interesting parallel with Venice that you have these lagoon creatures. In China, you have um, freshwater crabs and eels and shrimps. Um, and loaches, which are highly prized. You know, freshwater crabs are one of the incredible delicacies of the Jiangnan region. But also, there are so many water plants. Um, so not, I mean, in England, we just have watercress, really, maybe a bit of seaweed. But in the Jiangnan region, you have water chestnuts, um, water caltrops, which are a bit like, they're sort of water chestnut. They look like vampire bats with black horns, and they have a more starchy consistency. Um, you have cattails, which is a kind of bulrush. Um, water bamboo, or wild rice, which is a fascinating crop. Do you know, do you know huitlacoche, the Mexican smut fungus? Yeah. Yeah. So it's a fungus that invades corn and makes this, this very interesting. Mm -hmm. But in China, um, jiao bai, which is wild rice stem or water bamboo, is a, a wild grass that has been invaded by a fungus and its, its, um, its shoots swell up like bamboo shoots a bit. So this is another vegetable. Um, and then water shield, which has been a delicacy for thousands of years, water celery. So there are all these very interesting plants. And um, there's a chapter in, in this book about um, something qianshi, which is um, fox nuts, which is an extraordinary, I went to a farm, which was a huge plain covered in water. And um, the surface of the water had all these leaves um, the size of trays, satellite dishes. Um, and underwater, there were these enormous fruits that looked a bit like pomegranates. Yeah. And people were opening the fruits, and then these seeds like cherries come out. And inside the cherry, there's a little white seed the size of a pearl, a great delicacy, a sort of chewy stuff. But anyway, um, so I think of it as, you know, in China, they really do farm the water as well as the land, and not just for fish, but also all these interesting water plants. Uh, there, is, uh, there is also an uh, ongoing theme in, uh, in your book, which is the, the difference between <coughs> Western food and uh, Chinese food. Always <laughs> Chinese food wins, in, your, <laughs> in my opinion. <laughs> in your approach. <laughs> Actually, I think in the Financial Times there was some criticism of it. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> but, not, but, no, but I think it makes sense. No, uh, there is something that um, it's remarkable and it's uh, there is a sense where you you talk about the the chinese surprise at the dietary common sense the lack of dietary common sense by westerners no? and because of the the, the traditional uh, chinese diet is uh, so whole so complete and that it pays attention to all kinds of aspects health uh, temperature weather the t time of, uh, of the year etc i don't know if you could also uh, explain a little bit more about this. Uh... Yeah, um, well, I think uh, I just should say that, I mean, I, yeah, in, in a lot of the book, I do make a lot of often slightly disparaging remarks about <laughs> Western food, and it's <laughs> partly meant to be playful, and also no. because I think that Chinese food has been treated with so much prejudice in the West that I think yeah. it's quite fun <laughs> for readers to have a taste mm -hmm. of their own medicine <laughs> and to see it from the other point of view. And also, I would rather err in the side of being over-enthusiastic than mm -hmm. the historical 
you know, <laughs> disparagement. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, and that's one of the things, that, again, back to this old stereotype of Chinese food being unhealthy, which is entirely mm. based on a constructed American Chinese food, which uh, arose out of particular um, mm -hmm. historic circumstances. Um, but for the Chinese, food is medicine. The earliest Chinese recipes were medical prescriptions from mm -hmm. Han Dynasty tombs from about the third or second century BC. Um, and um, Chinese people, particularly the older, older generation, have an absolute instinct for treating food as medicine in a sort of informal, holistic, um, everyday sort of way. So people just talk constantly about what to... And seasonal. And seasonal, yeah, yeah. about how to eat. So both to, um, to treat symptoms or pre-symptoms, you know, something that may turn into illness later, indisposition, um, and also to eat according to the difference in climate. The reason that Sichuanese people eat so many chilies, um, according to Chinese medical law, is because it's very humid and you have to drive out the humidity. And also adjusting your diet according, according to the season. So in China, uh, you know, food and diet is not something that is seen in isolation. It's completely part of the environment and the person and the whole. It's it's part of everything, and um, and I've always found um, it's. Um, I mean, Chinese people have are sometimes quite amazed that Westerners do not even consider this. I mean, I think that our idea of good food tends often to be um, very difficult to apply in everyday life. It's sometimes based on individual superfoods or on numbers, you know, calories and proportions. And we don't, don't tend to have this instinct um, for, you know, a holistic mm -hmm. system. Um, but, um, yeah, I can't remember what else. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I guess Enrique wanted to know, like, who wins, I guess, in a sense, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I think that it's um, what I would say is that um, that the, the West has a lot to learn from Chinese food, mm -hmm. and people don't really realise that, yeah. both in terms of pleasure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's the, that's the thing actually. Yeah, the, the, for me, there are many arguments for why Chinese is an exceptional cuisine. You know, the, the centrality of food in Chinese culture, this very sophisticated mm -hmm. vocabulary and techniques. Um, the thoughtfulness about food and the you know ideas about food and medicine. But for me, the thing that that um, that I find exceptional and impressive is that um, it's very much a culture about pleasure in food, sensory delight, and this is something you see in poems from you know more than two thousand years ago. Um, but it's also a culture about health, and that I think in for example, in a European tradition, we might think about a really good meal as being you completely stuff your face with lots of rich food and desserts and so on, and then the next day you go on a diet and you eat just lettuce or something. Whereas in China, good food is, is always about pleasure, but it's also always about health and balance. And so a banquet um, in China, if it's well-constructed, um, should leave you feeling good, even if you've had 40 courses. Um, so a Chinese banquet um, will have not only strongly flavored dishes, rich, fatty, whatever, mm -hmm. but also light soups, vegetables. It's a considered whole. Um, and it will probably finish with a light soup or some fruit, not mm -hmm. with... Um, yeah, I mean, I, I wrote in the book about a Malaysian Chinese friend took me for dinner at the Fat Duck, which is um, probably the most famous restaurant in Britain. Heston Blumenthal is the chef, and it's all this incredibly inventive food. We had the most wonderful evening, and the food was ingenious and delicious. But at the end, my friend said, um, you know, Fuchsia, I feel as if I'm going to end up in a food coma because <laughs> I had, um, you know, the last four or five dishes had all been sweet, dairy, cloying, <laughs> heavy things. And she said, you know, in, if, you, if you were in China, even if you had this banquet of many courses, it would take you to a place where you would feel shufu, well or comfortable, mm -hmm. and go home for a good night's sleep. <laughs> so this, for me, I just feel like you can totally indulge yourself and feel great. So this, for yeah. me, is something that is really good about Chinese food. Well, well, you were saying... Oh. <laughs> sí, 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 sí. Yes. 
Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we have time for a few questions from the floor, if you have any. I know Sasha has millions. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I have two questions, and the first one is about the relationship between temperature and texture. And I really love how you describe kind of the pleasure that people find in different textures and thinking about kind of slimy, um, thinking about, you know, just how much the tongue is kind of put to work to experience an ingredient. But at the same time, I was thinking about heat, and this is something that you write about in the book, and this connection between cooking and civilization. And so also kind of perceptions of raw ingredients. So just to kind of add a footnote to why I'm interested in this, I've done a lot of research about cuisine and colonialism, and also thinking about who has a diet versus who has a cuisine in terms of representation. And I'm thinking about the work of Zona Spray Sparks mm -hmm. and Arctic cuisines. And so this idea that when we think about cooking just in terms of heat, you know, what really matters is this transformation of cells. So that could happen through fermentation, that could happen through freezing. So if you could talk a little bit about this connection between temperature and texture and how that plays into ideas of civilization and cuisine. And then my second question, which is a bit shorter, is um, related to the environment and um, animations of liveliness. So one of the things that I find really interesting is um, I grew up in Toronto, so I'm very familiar with Cantonese cuisine and memories of going to restaurants and having the fish still alive. And this difference between alive and fresh, and then often in Western cuisine, when people are eating meat, they don't want to be reminded that it was an animal. And my perception of Cantonese cuisine was there was a much stronger appreciation of that this was an animal and is an animal. So talking about this connection. Thank you. Okay, so the first question, I mean, the, the, this idea about eating cooked food as being the root of Chinese civilization, um, that when I was at the cooking school, on the very first page of our cooking textbook, um, it talked about the discovery of fire and how it was the discovery of fire and cooking which enabled people to leave behind the savage era of Ru Mao Yin Xue, which means um, um, drinking blood and eating feathers. It's a stock phrase for eating savage food. Um, you know, and so there is this idea, and, and in, in the distant past in China as well, there was an idea that barbarians uh, beyond the pale of the Chinese empire, they ate raw food and the Chinese ate cooked food. And it was a of real Of course, this is difference. all, I mean, yeah, historical construct on the part of the Chinese literati. Yeah, but I mean, it's just the, this idea that cooking is central to being civilized. And it's, it's interesting because even now, the Chinese eat much less raw food. And although actually, um, you know, salad, Ban Cai has become a bit trendy in, in urban restaurants now. You see these mixed leaf salads. That's really new. And normally food is transformed, if not by heat, then at least by salting or pickling or blanching, even where you have some things that are raw or pickling. Um, so it is a cooked food civilization. Um, and um, yeah, about t temperature and texture, um, yes, I mean, the absolute core skill of Chinese cooking is called ho ho, um, which is like fire and timing or waiting, and it's about the control of heat. Um, interestingly, one of my favorite Chinese texts is from the third century BC, the Ben Wei Pian, the root of taste chapter in the spring and autumn annals. And there's an absolutely magnificent description of cooking by a chef who's, who's talking to his king about politics in the form of a gastronomical allegory. But anyway, there's a passage in which he describes the transformation in the cooking cauldron and the delicate command of heat. And it, it's funny because it actually could very much apply to what I learned at the cooking school in the 1990s. So um, ho ho, the control of heat, is the most difficult thing in Chinese cooking. And um, it's at the heart of different cooking methods and the instinct of a chef. And I think particularly with stir frying, which again, 
you know, I think when people in the West think of stir frying, they just think of something, someone doing something fast in a wok. But actually, in China, there are many different words to describe different types of stir frying. You know, handling a wok. That, and um, texture is completely fundamental to what you choose in terms of your method. So, um, for example, if you're cooking shrimps, you know, that um, it, there are, broadly speaking, two you know, drastic different choices. Like you could dust them in starch and cook them in very hot oil so they're crispy and xiang, fragrant, crunchy. Um, or you could clothe them in a light starch batter and then guo pass them through the oil, or just qing liu, like just, it's another word for cook, kind of poaching in oil that's not too hot. So you just set the starch layer into a lovely slippery kind of clothing. And then, you know, you, you have this very delicate, tender shrimp. And so um, it's the same ingredient, but it's showing drastically different um, aspects and you know there are different <laughs> talking about Chinese cooking methods one of the words for the cooking methods that I learnt in Sichuan was liu and liu means to um, to take an ingredient cut it up into small pieces or in shrimps they're already small and then to pre-cook them in oil or water then separately to make a sauce in the wok and then to combine the two together so in English, we have no word for this. It's one word in Chinese, and it expresses all that. That took me you know, a couple of sentences to explain. Um, so yes, and um, Yuan Mei, the great 18th century food writer, he said, I can't remember, there's a quote, is in my book, I can't remember exactly what it was, but he said, when a chef has mastered Ho Ho, the command of heat, then he's basically achieved the Tao of cooking. <laughs> you know, that's what it's about. Um, and I think that, um, it's a skill that's very difficult to express in words because, you know, from a scientific point of view, you have all these variables. You know, how thick is your wok? How hot is the fire? Um, how much oil do you have? How hot is the oil when you put the ingredient in? How long do you cook it? Blah, blah, blah. All these things, fantastically complicated, and there's no way, really, of... of putting all that in a recipe. It's very much about the instinct acquired over years of training, and that's why I kind of totally worship walk chefs who can do it right every time, because I think it's just a, an extraordinary skill. Um, so that's a bit about texture, and, and just that, um, particularly in the Cantonese South, like the Cantonese are some of the world's best eaters. Like they are so precise in their appreciation of food. Talk to anyone Cantonese, um, about eating and they'll always talk about texture and they will be minutely critical about, you know, is it crisp, is it slippery, is it right? So completely. On to the thing about liveliness. Um, so yes, um, I think that there is a sort of, you know, w when we were at university in Sichuan, you know, it was all in front of you. All the chickens were live and they were being killed in the markets and so on, which was very confronting at first for someone who doesn't see that normally. Um, I would say that that's changing in China now and that redevelopment of cities has have been, resulted in the destruction of many markets. And young people are kind of losing touch with that, I think, in, in the same way that we have already lost touch. Um, but... Um, yeah, and, but there is still, the Cantonese are infamous in China for obsession with freshness and actually a common criticism of people in other parts of China, they'll say, oh, Chinese, uh, Cantonese food, it's too sheng, like raw or live, you know, it's too much for them. Um, and, um, but interestingly, Yuan Mei, again, this great 18th century writer about food, that he made a distinction between um, what he called live meat and dead meat. So, um, and people still talk about this in China, that like live meat um, is meat that when you eat it has a liveliness of texture. So, um, for example, a fish that is just cooked will have a sort of sprightly briskness of texture. Um, and also parts of creatures that have been active 
are more live and therefore more delicious. So a chicken's wings or legs, which have exercised, you know, or a free-range chicken, those are more desirable than a, a Western chicken breast, which is like sawdust or, you know, just like flaccid, not interesting. Um, and that is what a Chinese chef would call dead meat, which has not exercised, or overcooked fish. So this, this sort of tautness, this almost bounciness sometimes, which again, I think, can be quite confronting for Westerners, but this, this sort of elasticity and a little resistance is, is a sign of life and vigour in your food. I think food. I mean, clearly, Sasha also wanted to... I know you are very careful with politics, in a sense, I mean, but there's all, of course, there is politics around food, and, right, that's what you were sort of what trying... Well, in the sense of how the identities are defined vis-a-vis -vis rawness or so cookness. Th there was right? one more question. Yeah. Oh, yes. <coughs> Thanks so much. This is really fascinating. I wanted to ask a question which is, you're talking about the killing of the chickens, which is about where food is coming from and the sourcing of, of ingredients. And you were talking a little bit about changing eating habits. I'm also thinking about the changes in Chinese population. And I'm wondering how that affects, well, to what extent where the proportions are in terms of ingredients that are being sourced from within China versus in, importing. So, for example, I work in, in Latin America, and I know that in the last 10, 15, 20 years, the soy industry in Argentina has grown massively because of the demand from China. So I just wonder if you could say a little bit about that, about kind of the, the sort of changing trends in sourcing in, sources in, in ingredients, what that does for China's kind of sense of itself and the rest of the world. Yeah. Um, well, so um, yeah, the food chain has suddenly dramatically massively extended in China. Mm. So when I was a student there, um, a lot of the food eaten in Chengdu was coming in from the surrounding countryside. I mean, literally, you'd have farmers coming in with a cart with all their ducks tied up on the back, alive, wow. you know? And, um, and also, um, historically and culturally, there is a long-standing... Um, obsession with what you might call in modern terms terroir and sourcing and provenance. So, you know, anyone in China can tell you what the most famous foods of their hometown are. If you go on holiday, what you do is you want to eat the most famous foods. There is an idea that the best Longjing tea leaves come from these particular hills in this particular city, Hangzhou. Um, so there is a, a very sentimental idea of of locality and food and identity. Um, and as you suggested, yes, um, there is more and more imported food. It's really interesting, the craze in China for eating offal, um, you know, the, the chicken's feet and things. Well, I discovered one, I was writing an article about, pork. There, there was a big, China and Britain did a big pork deal 10 or 15 years ago, a $50 million pork deal. And it turned out that the Chinese were basically importing pigs' tails and stomachs and feet um, because there were all these empty shipping containers that had taken iPhones, etc., to Britain. And they were all going back empty. So practically for free, the manufacturer producers of pork and chickens could ship all the frozen offal back to China, where it was a huge delicacy. Um, so, yeah, and, and it's quite interesting how um, these parts of animals which are prized for their texture and grapple and all these other reasons um, have become quite ubiquitous and that can only be because of imports because you know there just aren't enough I don't imagine there are enough rabbits in Sichuan to produce all the rabbit heads that are eaten on as a snack in Chengdu these days um, so yeah there is now um, there is more factory farming in China you know, I've seen reports about these kind of pig hotels, like vertical pig farms that they're, I don't know whether they actually built them or they're just building them now. Um, but um, now they've been built already, yeah. Yeah, and um, yes, and I think it is, um, it's a real sort of watershed for ideas about identity and food and so on. Um, one of the greatest delicacies of the Jiangnan region, you know, around Shanghai, is the Shi Yu, the Reeves Shad or hilsa herring. So it's this wonderful um, fresh water, uh, fish that is, comes in from the sea. So it's a bit salt, a bit fresh, mm -hmm. and has this very rich, oily flesh, completely delicious. 
Um, so you can still get this. It was only, you know, you could only eat it for a few weeks a year, and the poets wrote about it. You know, it was this amazing delicacy. Um, so you can still eat this fish in Shanghai in a posh restaurant, but it's now imported frozen from Bangladesh mm -hmm. because hydroelectric dams, dams and pollution mm -hmm. mean there are no reefs shad in the Yangtze River or anything else. There were all these... So, um, so yes, I think there's a bit of... Um, how to say, I think people would like to pretend this is not happening, so you would pretend you're having this classic Yangtze dish, but it's actually imported. Um, yeah, um, hard to say, but uh, yeah, I think it's the same in many different places, right, where our food systems are, um, we have a sentimental idea which we paste on top of the menu, but there's a lot of ugly stuff going on underneath. I mean, there's many signals that uh, that uh, the the Chinese food system is is broken in many ways. Uh, there's massive issues around rice, massive issues around yeah. you know, pig farming. Uh, I mean, the only thing is, I mean, the the thing that that I feel very strongly is that um, you know it's a really gastronomic culture, and the, the people really care about food. So I would have thought that if anyone can address these issues, it should be the Chinese, you know, because they really care about it. So there is this sort of, in the, in the cultural DNA, there is an, a, an idea that food should be local and fresh and well produced. So um, just as the Chinese in some cases have been much faster than in the West to adapt sustainable technologies like, you know, r r the long life light bulbs, for example. Every farmer in China was using them ages before they were used in the West. Um, so, the, you know, having an authoritarian government has one advantage, which is you can do things fast. And if, you know, if the same attention that has been applied to some, you know, environmental technologies was applied to the food system, mm. let's see, I don't know. Thank you. <laughs> no, she's not a China apologist, I promise. <laughs> Actually, no, I'm just thinking about, you know, you know um, Jarrett Diamond's book, Collapse, that there's a very interesting chapter about the island of Hispaniola and looking at how Haiti um, is completely deforested. Mm -hmm. But they had, um, in the Dominican Republic, there was, I can't remember all the details, but they had a dictator who decided to keep the forests. Mm -hmm. And it was just like you can look on a satellite image and half the island. I mean, it's, it's just an interesting question. What is it? I don't know. Yeah. Okay. I think. Uh, uh, any more questions? Uh, if not, uh, we can. We should go out for an enormous Chinese banquet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No. No. Something else very interesting about the book is that finally I understood why. Uh, the difference in Chinese restaurants in the US, in Europe, London, uh, Spain, uh, which is, uh, well, it's very well explained no? <laughs> in the book. Uh, across, I don't know if you've run into many Taiwanese restaurants. Across the street from my apartment is one. Oh. And they offer the same food. <laughs> but the name is very important for them. Yes. Obviously. I went to an amazing Taiwanese restaurant in Los Angeles a couple oh, of weeks ago. Okay which I wish would open a branch in my neighborhood in London. Frankly. Yeah. Thank you so much, Fuchsia. Thank you. <coughs>